Good evening, dear members and friends of the ELI. It's a great honor and privilege for me to be chairing and opening today's webinar. This is a very special occasion. It's not only the first ELI webinar in 2021, it's also the first ELI webinar on what we call an ELI innovation paper. Now, all of you may be wondering what is an ELI e innovation paper, because any kind of work the ELI has been doing so far tries to be innovative. But the work Eli does is normally work that takes about one year or two years or three years. And it normally is done by a broader project team with advisory committee, membership consultative committee. It's a very lengthy procedure. And then it results in something like model rules or legislative instruments or a set of principles. And you've all seen a lot of this work already published. Now, the ELI will certainly continue engaging in that kind of work, but we felt that it might be a good idea to also open up a second channel, a work that is more tentative in nature, that comes quickly and uh, is uh, in time to still, you know, react uh, to current developments while they are being discussed and uh, uh, that sometimes means that you need a more streamlined procedure. And so we uh, uh, started a pilot innovation paper and uh, the topic which the ELI chose for that pilot innovation paper was a very important topic, a topic we believe is key to some of the discussions we are seeing now about artificial intelligence, about uh, liability for artificial intelligence and other uh, digital uh, uh, technologies. It's a product liability and it's updating the product liability directive, which we all know dates from the 1980s for the digital age. And we asked Professor Christian Twig Flesner, whom I uh, welcome to this panel, uh, to author this first Eli innovation paper. And we are very grateful to Christian, who's going to say a couple of words also on the procedure and how he went about it. Um, so uh, Christian authored this and will present the innovation paper in a couple of minutes. But I'm also very happy to uh, uh, welcome uh, other distinguished panelists. And um, I, I would like to uh, greet uh, Mark Beamish. He's legal and policy officer at the Directorate General for Internal Market Industry, Entrepreneurship and uh, 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 Small and Medium Enterprises at the European Commission. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to uh, greet Dr. Machnikowski. He's professor of law at Wroclaw University and uh, a member of the litigation and arbitration practice in Benton's Warsaw office. And Piotr was a member of the expert group of the European Commission um, on uh, liability and digital technologies. He was even a member in both formations. He was an, an, a, a real member in the new technologies formation and an observer to the product liability formation. And I'm happy to see uh, Augustine Reiner here. He's Director of Legal and Economic Affairs at the European Consumer Organization, BERG. So uh, welcome um, all of you, and we are very happy that you could make it and discuss with us as these uh, topical issues and the guiding principles which uh, Christian has identified. And over to you, Christian, please tell us more about how you went about it and what are the guiding principles you suggest for uh, the legislator to take on board. Thank you very much, Christiana, for your kind introduction and uh, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be able to uh, share this first Eli innovation paper with you. 
Um, as Christiana said, it's a pilot exercise. So maybe I should say a few words about how we went about the process of, of getting to this paper, even though it's got my name on as the, as the author or as the rapporteur, however you would like to put it, there is actually a considerable input behind the, uh, the uh, final product, not just from me, but from Eli members in general. I was approached on behalf of the council to take the lead in drafting this pilot innovation paper on the guiding principles for getting the product liability fit for the digital age. And I commenced this by identifying what I thought might be the salient issues in this process. And I prepared an initial draft, which I discussed with members of the council executive in the first instance. Following that, I prepared a slightly revised preliminary draft, which was then sent to all council members, uh, sorry, all, all ELI members, the entire membership of the European Law Institute for their input. And I was delighted and quite excited to receive a lot of detailed substantive comments from either individual members or a group of, of members of the, of the European Law Institute, which fed back some really interesting comments and observations on this preliminary draft. And in light of the comments I received and on occasion after some reconciliation between conflicting or opposing comments, I then prepared a, a final draft version of the paper which was then voted on by the European Law Institute's Council and then published in January. In drafting the paper, uh, I tried to take on board the idea that this was meant to be a, an innovation paper and therefore a contribution to an ongoing debate, or perhaps an opportunity to relaunch a debate which might have fallen silent a little bit. And it is my hope that this will be the, st the starting point of a debate about how we can improve the product liability directive in the digital age. It is not intended as the final word, unlike many other ELI projects, which are a much more definitive, carefully elaborated statement on a given topic. This is very much an attempt to come up with um, uh, an initial position that obviously requires further discussion and could indeed be elaborated in the future, even by the European Law Institute in something more concrete and final. But at this point, it is meant to introduce a number of ideas and help shape the discussion which is clearly needed in order to modernize the product liability directive. It comprises 10 guiding principles. I will not necessarily go through each of these in detail in the 10 minutes I have and I hope you've had a chance to, to read the paper. It is only 10 pages to read so it's not extensive but let me say a few words about each of these principles very briefly. The guiding principles combine in part general objectives, which I think the product liability regime ought to either pursue or maintain, as it already pursues them in the original version, and some additional guiding principles, which are much more specific on quite concrete elements of the current directive and where improvements are needed. Guiding principle one, for instance, tries to capture the, the gist of what the product liability regime is trying to do which is to provide a simple route to compensation for a person, for an individual who has either been injured by a defective product or who has suffered property damage caused by a defective product. And it is important that we do not lose sight of this overarching objective to make compensation easy and perhaps a little bit easier for individuals to obtain in case they have suffered personal injury or, or damage to their property. Principle two then seeks to ensure that whatever we do, we do not lose sight of the fact that we have competing interests that need to be reconciled in the product liability regime. On the one hand, we have the individuals who have suffered, who have been injured. On the other hand, we have business producers, manufacturers innovating, and especially now in the digital age, trying to take advantage of the digital economy and the opportunity this offers. And therefore need to make sure that we do not overprotect individuals at the expense of stifling innovation. But uh, we need to ensure that innovation remains possible and indeed is encouraged in a clear, consistent product liability regime. Guiding principle three reminds us that we need to ensure consistency across the European archy wherever possible. Sometimes variations between different measures are clearly justified because of the wider underlying policies being pursued and indeed the targets of some of these measures. For instance, whilst there is a degree of, of reconciliation with the general product safety regime, which is desirable, 
this doesn't necessarily mean that the two should be entirely aligned. There are reasons why there might be some variations in some aspects, but it's certainly important that as part of the review process, we consider better alignment, say, between the product liability directive and the general safety regime, but also the consumer sales regime to the extent that consumers may be directly affected by um, faulty products, defective products, which cause injury. Guiding principle four is then the first that goes into more specific aspects. It talks about the need to revise the idea of product itself. And here I suggest there are two dimensions. One might be a simple clarification to put a matter beyond doubt, which is that the product liability directive covers products which have digital elements to use the terminology now found in the new consumer sales directive. This may already be the case now, but there is some residual doubt, and this could be clarified very easily by, by including a clarification to that effect in the revised directive. But it seems to me that it's also necessary to extend the reach of the directive to fully digital products. In other words, things that are just digital, whether that is pieces of software or applications, whether that is uh, an artificial uh, intelligence algorithm, uh, things like that. There might be a need to go broader in defining product to include these digital only products. Guiding principle five then looks at the persons who are liable in or, uh, to provide compensation, which under the current directive, as you will be aware, falls on the producer, but also with some extensions, it can include importers. And in a small number of defined circumstances, it can also include a supplier. There are two particular parties who I think might be candidates for being incorporated in an extended notion of the, the persons who should be liable towards harmed individuals. First of all, because of the nature of many products with digital elements, and indeed digital products, uh, which doesn't involve a single supply, but an ongoing supply, there will be businesses providing updates, monitoring, data input. So perhaps they might have some role to play and should be considered as part of a wider pool of responsible parties. As might online platforms, at least in some instances, we know that online platforms can have a very active role to play and might be perceived by individuals as de facto suppliers I think many of us will be aware of the case law that's come from the United States on the role of one particular marketplace platform uh, who shall remain nameless tonight. Uh, it's something like Nile, but not quite. Uh, and therefore, um, we will uh, maybe need to think about extending the reach of product liability to these online platforms. A parallel can be found already in the market surveillance regulation, which has a very distinct policy objective, but has recognized the particular role online platforms play in the distribution process when it comes to consumer goods. Guiding principle six suggests that we look at the notion of defect. There's some work to be done there, but one thing I flag up here and elsewhere is the fact that the directive repeatedly refers to the point at which a product is put into circulation, which made sense in 1985, where a finished item was effectively handed over into the distribution and consumption process. But now we have this continuity of updating of digital content, and there isn't really necessarily, it's still a fixed moment when products are put into circulation. So maybe that notion itself requires revisiting and, uh, um, uh, and redefining. Guiding principle seven looks at the notion of damage and highlights the fact that this should now be extended to include digital damage. In other words, damage to data, uh, damage to digital content created by the harmed individual uh, and similar. Guiding principle eight looks at the greater evidentiary burden which harmed individuals now face because of the complexity of goods with digital content and the interaction of digital elements and physical elements. And indeed, in the Internet of Things, for example, the combination of lots of different devices in a wider package. So guiding principle eight suggests on the one hand that we might need to have an, an easier threshold for proving damage, which doesn't require the harmed individual to pinpoint the exact locus of the damage but that it should be sufficient to pinpoint that the package as a whole, if there is such a package, is uh, defective and therefore has caused the injury. There's also an argument to reverse the burden of proof, particularly where goods rely, for example, on external data input. But again, it would be very, very difficult for the, for the individual to, to show 
that a product was in fact defective. Guiding principle nine uh, focuses on the various defenses, again, referring to the difficulty with um, the threshold of putting products into circulation as the key time scale. Um, and also the fact that there might be an issue with regards to the development risks defense, which of course has been hotly debated ever since the directive was adopted. And finally, guiding principle 10 uh, comes last, but it's in my view, one of the most important ones. It is important now that when we have a system whereby an individual has an easy route for claiming redress, especially if the pool of parties responsible towards that individual is broadened, that is a behind the scenes recourse system, which allows the loss ultimately to be channeled by whatever route to the person who can ultimately be identified as being responsible. Um, but not requiring the harmed individual to do so, but to allow for this to be done behind the scenes by the businesses involved in the supply of the product. Um, not necessarily following the chain of contracts as is currently envisaged, for example, in the Scoff and Bilker case from the Court of Justice. Um, and also perhaps to consider whether an alternative mechanism, for example, some collective fund might be appropriate here. So I've tried to, I've gone slightly over my time, but I've tried to give you a very, very quick snapshot of these guiding principles and, and to also say a little bit about how we got to where we are. And I look forward to hearing uh, more from everyone. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you so much, Christian, for that very concise overview. And of course, for all your efforts with this paper, we've had so many discussions and it was so fruitful and we all enjoyed it very much. Uh, but now I would like to hand over to uh, Piotr. Piotr, you were a member um, of the Commission Expert Group and you worked extensively on that in the Group on European Tort Law and in other contexts. So um, to what extent do you see overlaps with the work done by the expert group, by the European Group on Tort Law? What is your view on uh, the guiding principles as Christian has just presented them? Well, uh, thank you very much and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this webinar, the first webinar on the first ELI innovation paper. Uh, it's an honor, but it's also a pleasure because, answering your question, because I think that the, the innovation paper is very important and it's very thought provoking and it's very much in line with what we uh, were considering, what we were thinking about in the, uh, in the expert group. So uh, it's nice to see that uh, so many people are thinking in a similar way and are going the same direction. Uh, in this few minutes of your time that I have at my disposal, I'd like to focus on what I believe is the most important aspect of the reform proposed by, uh, by Christian in this paper. And to me, this most crucial aspect is the idea of extending the European product liability regime to digital products. Uh, of course, it, as Christian said uh, a few minutes ago, uh, products with digital content or products with digital elements uh, probably are already or most likely are already covered by the directive. But still the question remains whether the, the, this digital component is a component in the, uh, in, in, in the uh, sense of the directive. So if the producer, the author of the code, the producer of digital component is a producer of a component part in the sense of the directive, so whether this person is liable for for damage caused by the defective product where the content was used. And if so, why is this person liable as a producer of a component part? And it's not liable where the same code, the same program is marketed separately. So uh, even if this problem is solved already, it's only solved partially. But most likely the purely digital products are not subject to, the, to this liability regime. So I would try to to explain why I believe that uh, such a change would be no revolution, but a natural next step in the development of the law. And then I will try to highlight some of the consequences and some difficulties with which taking this step. And this is, uh, to assess whether including digital product in the PLD would be a revolutionary change, uh, it would be useful to, to, to see the problem in a broader context. And to do so, we must go back in time some 50 years when the product liability in Europe was emerging. Uh, and we have to remember that the 
product liability, strict rules on liability for defective uh, products were a reaction to the shortcomings of existing tort and contract law. So tort law required in such a case, required the victim to prove wrongdoing and causation. And this was difficult in case of product related damage because of complex production uh, process and extensive uh, distribution network. But contract law gave claims only to contracting party against the other party. So it did not protect bystanders and it did not allow the, the, the buyer to sue the manufacturer. So those uh, shortcomings resulted in, in thinking, the European legislators thinking about uh, different liability regime or about changing the existing regime so to afford protection to, to victims of defective products. And uh, it resulted in various models of product liability which began to emerge in Europe in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, those models were based either on easing or changing the burden of proof of fault liability or they consisted in special liability, strict liability, liability independent of fault. So the idea of European product liability arose not only to protect the interests of injured parties, which is rightly emphasized in guiding principle one of our paper, but it also aimed at harmonizing laws and at creating level playing field for businesses in the common market. And it's important to remember that because the question is, do we have a similar problem now and can we apply the similar solution? And in my opinion, Yes, we have a similar problem or we may have a similar problem in the near future and we can apply the similar solution. So the question is whether the digital product are similar to traditional product in respect of, of uh, possibility of damage and, and need for liability. And what uh, I'd like to make clear is that uh, this simple notion, which I think Christian explained briefly in his speech, the simple notion on which the, the European product liability law is, uh, is based, that is the producer should compensate for the damage caused by its defect, by the fact of its product, uh, regardless of whether he was at fault or not in putting this product, defective product in, on the market. The simple notion served three main objectives. First, it provides protection to all victims. Not all types of damage are repairable, but all kinds of victims are protected. Uh, secondly, it places responsibility on the producer, that is, places responsibility on the one who can most easily prevent the damage. Thus, the liability rule induces the producer to maintain the quality of the product. And thirdly, by placing the burden on the producer, that is, the person who manufactures the products, usually in greater numbers and for profit, this liability rule makes it relatively easy to distribute the economic burden of the damage among many people. So the producer can do it either by price mechanism or through insurance. And in short, there are three main functions of, of this liability, compensation, deterrence, and loss spreading. And of course, PLD provisions are formulated in such a way that they seem to apply only to tangible products. But in my view, it's accidental. Simply nobody contemplated other products and tangible products in 1970s where the directive was drafted, or in 1985 when it was adopted. Uh, and not that somebody thought that this liability regime can be applied only to, to tangible products because of some of its features. I don't think so. So let us fast forward those 50 years again. And now we see products on the market which are tangible, but their performance is determined by the software and data. And we also see products which are purely digital, they are software and data. And we cannot rule out that those product, products uh, cause damage, especially when we think about medical products. It's quite easy to imagine that uh, software used for, for, for medical purposes can cause damage. So coming back to my question, do we face the same problem? Yes, I think that we, we, we may face the same problem. That is national legislators and national courts looking for new or modified rules of liability to, to protect victims of uh, digital products. And this may result in the same situation that is fragmentation of European legal area in this respect. 
Uh, can we use the same solution? Well, I'm pretty sure that in principle we can, because the, whether the product is traditional or is digital, the same rules that is strict liability of the producer for a defect should achieve the same objectives, compensation, deterrence, and loss spreading. So I think that the advice uh, contained in the guiding principle for the advice to change the definition of the product is correct, and it's a logical development of the law. But the devil is, as usual, in the detail. Uh, I do not have much time, so I'll try to briefly outline the most important implications of, of, of this change. And most of them are already mentioned in the, in the paper anyway. So firstly, there's an important question of which particular intangible goods are to be considered products. Because there are many kinds of intangible goods that can be produced and marketed in the course of business activity, and they are capable of causing damage. But I'm not sure if strict liability is suitable for all of them, especially because of the risk of so-called over deterrence, that is the risk of stifling the socially useful activity, which is, I think, the content and the aim of the principle number two. And particularly difficult for me uh, is the case of digitally stored information. We can see information, digitally stored information as a product, something which is put uh, to circulation, such as geographical data, medical knowledge, other expertise. And the application of strict liability for defects uh, in this case would mean that the producer is liable for any inaccuracy in the information. And this may have a negative impact on the level of activity of producers of this type of products. And as a result, it may limit public access to knowledge, which I think we don't want to, to achieve. So I believe that in this area, traditional liability based on, based on fault, that is based on the criterion of reasonable care, simply works better. The second uh, important uh, difficulty is, uh, as was also rightly emphasized in Guiding Principle 6, that contemporary digital products or products with digital components are no longer marketed once at a particular point in time. Uh, and Christian has explained it uh, very clearly. They are subject to continuous improvement and enhancement. So first, the model adopted in the PLD, which is based on a test whether the product was defective or was not defective at the moment it was put into circulation, simply don't work anymore. Uh, and this key moment either no longer exists or is, is not such important as it was, not uh, as much important as it was before. So we, we must take into account that there are some subsequent actions either taken by the producer or controlled by the producer, such as software updates, which influence the way the product operates. And this leads to the third problem, that is the directive in Article 11 uh, limits the producer's liability to a period of 10 years from the time the product was the product which caused the damage was put, put into circulation. And this limitation also is based on the assumption that there is such a single point in time. If there's no such a single point in time, we need to reconsider the time limit, the way it is, it is, it is constructed. And fourthly, I think that it is important that if we want to, to, to recognize it, if we want to include digital products in the regime of the directive, we must somehow address the problem of so-called autonomy of devices. This autonomy is believed to be a feature of artificial intelligence. And in simple terms and from the liability perspective, uh, I think two facts are important here. First, that a device can change its properties and change it, its behavior as a result of data obtained after it was placed on the market. And secondly, uh, the device may take, or the, 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 the artificial, artificial intelligence may take a decision which was not determined by its manufacturer program or programmer. And these features may cause an initially safe product to become unsafe in the course of its operation. But it's not predetermined from the start, it's just possible. So I think it should be made clear in the law that if these features, is what I called autonomy, allow the product to become unsafe, such product should be considered defective from the beginning, even though those, its dangerous characteristics appeared only after it was put into circulation. And of course, it was, as was said in guiding principle 10, 
uh, in such a case, manufacturer should not be able to rely on development risk defense. So these were uh, some of the more detailed aspects of proposed modernization of product liability law. And to, for, to conclude briefly, we have a bit of a winding road ahead of us, but I think it's worth going down. Uh, thank you very much and congratulations to Christian and the ELI Council for a great job. Thank you. Thank you so much, Piotr, for sharing your insight. Actually, we have to be careful not to have too much harmony on the panel. Um, so we need some critical questions. I see one critical question, which is already in the Q&A. I hope everybody knows how to use the Q&A function. So be uh, uh, make yourself uh, uh, familiar with uh, that function. And uh, please make sure that you ask all the critical questions, because this is uh, uh, what we need and 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 what keeps uh, the the discussion going, but um, um, I'm now very happy to pass the floor to Augustine. Uh, product liability is, of course, also consumer protection law, and so consumers have a very clear view uh, of uh, what should be changed. And Berg has done a lot of work, actually in that area already on uh, Internet of Things devices and all sorts of other questions, um, all the sorts of other challenges which consumers face in the digital world and which consumer law has to face in the digital world. So Augustine, the floor is yours. I understood that you wanted to share some slides, so um, that yes, should I be possible do, now. Uh, I hope you can see my slides now. Yes, perfect. Excellent. Thank you very much, Christian, and yeah, everybody involved in the organization of this uh, on this webinar. I'm very, very happy to to be part of it and, and share with you the work that we have been doing in, in Beuk. Also, thank you, Christian, um, for the excellent paper. I think it's um, includes extremely important uh, recommendations that we hope the Commission will uh, take note of it as well and and and, and think forward uh, in the revision of the of the liability framework. Um, as you mentioned, uh, Christian, the Product Liability Directive it's an extremely important instrument for consumers. Uh, it's part of consumer law in the in the broad sense uh, and uh, and indeed uh, as it was mentioned earlier this is a directive that dates from the 80s uh, long before all these products and all these ways of distributing goods um, have emerged and, and and certainly it's it's high time that the directive needs to be updated and there are basically two aspects that I would like um, to focus the first one, relates to new technologies. And for example, we have uh, conducted with our members uh, surveys in, in different countries. Uh, and, and, and it was it's quite remarkable that, you know, most of consumers, you know, will not have any clue about who will be responsible in case of damages caused by a, a artificial intelligence system. Um, and, 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 and likewise, um, there are, of course, concerns about the, um, the eventual harms that these uh, new technologies can, 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 can cause on, 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 on consumers and their, and their, and their property. Um, similarly, um, if we look at um, the distribution of goods online, for example, through online marketplaces, um, a new study that we conducted together with our Dutch member, Consumentum Bond, um, that uh, carry out a mystery shopping exercise, showed that there is a significant and increasing the number of unsafe, pro unsafe products sold online via social media, so via yeah, social media, but as well um, uh, online uh, online market um, uh, marketplaces. We are actually um, uh, publishing this this report and hosting a, a discussion um, about the, the the foundings of the report uh, next Thursday. Um, so everybody is, is welcome to uh, to join. And, and one of the things that uh, these people have shown that in a sample of products that have been selected, 66% of, of them, they were considered as unsafe. And that range for from toys 
for children through smoke alarms, USB chargers, or a wide range of, of consumers' products that are um, very popular on online marketplaces. And of course, as, as, as we know, um, the current uh, liability regime uh, does not uh, cover, at least in, in, in Europe, um, online, online marketplaces. Um, so taking a bit of inspiration of, of the work done by, by, by Christian, so we, we try, to, um, to try to define what are those consumer principles for an updated product liability framework. And I think uh, we all agree that we need a clear framework, something that is updated and easy to navigate for the, for the consumer. I think here it's extremely important um, to keep, um, not to say consistency, but uh, harmony between the different instruments regulating different liability situations. So, for example, the Commission now is going to propose a, um, a liability um, system for high-risk um, AI products, which, of course, there are merits uh, for having something tailored for high-risk products, but we cannot forget that the wide majority of consumer products will fall uh, most likely in the scope of the product liability directive or, or national tort rule regime. So it's extremely important to keep and have a product liability which is updated because ultimately it works for a, as, as a safety net um, for, for consumers. Uh, likewise, consumers should be able um, to easily identify you know, who is the liable party and where, where to go where things go, go wrong. And, and here the, the concept of joint liability of all professional involved in the, in the supply chain. It's, it's extremely important also as a, as a means to ensure access, access to justice. Um, uh, also, the um, uh, liability rules need to take into account the dynamic nature of AI, AI power products or any type of goods actually with digital content embedded or standalone software as actually uh, Christian mentioned um, already um, the, the current system it's, it's simply not sufficient because you have a lot of products that whose functionality depends on update, for example, and that the digital content remains in, in, in conformity through a certain period of time beyond the moment when the product was put um, on the market. Another uh, interesting um, discussion relates to the notion of defect um, and the question where this should be broadened to encompass not only safety expectations, but also other type of expectations, rational expectation of user, for example, um, regarding products to be uh, GDPR compliant or free from cybersecurity failures. I'm, I'm going to talk a bit later on, on, on this point because I think it's, it's quite a crucial point in the, in the directive. Um, regarding the burden of proof as well, it needs to be adapted um, to make it easier to prove for consumers both the defect and the causation between the, the defects and the, and, and the harm. And in this regard, the reverse of burden of proof should be further considered, as well as um, the damages that can be compensated. I think here we, uh, we consider that they should not be liability thresholds. And it could be also the compensation extended, uh, not only to pure economic loss, but also to damage to data, for example. Um, and then regarding um, online marketplaces, we do think that there is a case to extend the liability uh, to online marketplaces when they have a predominant influence or control in the transaction chain. Um, in, in this regard, taking also experience, inspiration from um, the case law in the, in the, in the, in the US, um, clearly shows that you know, when, the, when a, a platform has such a dominant or, or predominant or control over the distribution of goods because they control from um, the logistics for shipping the goods uh, to the payment method after sales services. So there are different elements that one um, where from where one can infer that this um, platform have a predominant influence and therefore to the eyes of the consumer, it's uh, pretty much the same as a seller or as a supplier. 
but additionally, we think that uh, it could also be considered a subsidiary liability in cases when, for example, the producer cannot be identified uh, or the marketplaces have failed to inform the consumer in due time about the identity of the producer or does not enable the communication between the consumer and the producer or the supplier in order to get the relevant contact details in order to address the, uh, the complaint, um, as well as where the, in situations where the marketplace have received clear evidence about non-compliant products on its platform. And this is something that, for example, consumer organizations have been doing constantly in the last um, years, and especially now during the, uh, the pandemic, because the, the increase of, of uh, unsafe products all online has uh, literally uh, high rocketed, and we have evidence and from our members in the in the UK, in France, the Netherlands, um, Germany. So certainly, this is a, a, an area of, of, of concern. We um, uh, have some promising political support for this in the European Parliament, for example, who is openly already um, endorsed the need to revise the Product Liability Directive, and the Internal Market and Consumer Protection Committee also recognizing its opinion the necessity to hold online marketplaces liable under the um, PLD in certain circumstances. And then the, the actually last point I would like uh, to make is also the importance to have an integrated and multifaceted approach when we regulate liability. And here we need to look at how the PLD will interplay, for example, with the general product safety legislation, the Digital Services Act, which are all legislations that are currently being discussed. Um, of course, each instrument follows different objectives. Uh, and rightly so, but they need to work together in order to avoid frictions between the different legal regimes. For example, the, under the general product safety legislation, it would be very important for surveillance authorities to be able to address um, safety uh, concerns uh, directly to the online marketplaces. Um, the Digital Services Act, if we will make an um, online platform liable under the PLD, well, we need to ensure then that in the liability regime for intermediaries, this platform, then they cannot shield and say, and say we are not liable. So here we also um, need to um, uh, make sure that this platform can be considered liable when they have a prominent influence or controlling the transaction. And then the last point on the on the PLD, which is um, about the safety expectations and whether this concept should not be extended um, to the consumer rational expectation regarding digital products. And of course, um, the, it's extremely difficult then to define what these rational expectations are. Generally, when we talk about rational expectation, we look, for example, at the behavior of consumer regarding analog products. But here we're talking about products that are entirely new in the market. Um, so one perhaps might need to look, for example, on where there are normative benchmarks that can inform such expectations. And, and here we can look, for example, the relationship with the sales of good directives with something, the new directive, that's something that Christian highlighted, uh, as well as the GDPR and the, and the Cyber um, Security um, Act. Um, so that's from, um, from, from my side. I'm more than happy to, to discuss any of, this, uh, of these points and, and thank you again for, for the invitation. Well, thank you so much, Augustine, and also for putting the PLD into the broader picture, because it's indeed, you can't just look at product liability, you have to look at it in the context of product safety, market surveillance, the Digital Services Act, and all the other pieces of legislation, which we already have or that are in the pipeline. And uh, speaking of pipeline, um, I would like to hand over to Mark. So, Mark, um, you're in charge of this file at the European Commission. Um, probably you cannot share any super secret developments with us, but we are really looking forward to hearing your view of, um, well, the guiding principles, of course, but also maybe to um, hear from you what you would expect the European legislator to do or not to do in that area. 
Please, Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the, for the floor and I'll do my best to, to share whatever um, information can be shared uh, at the moment, as you said. Uh, so good evening, everybody, and thank you for the organizers, um, European Law Institute, um, and thank you for the authors of the, um, the innovation paper, which really is excellent food for thought. Um, and we'll have certainly a very close um, look at that. I'll come on to um, a few reflections on that in a moment, but uh, maybe chair to your other question, perhaps setting out where, where we are in the policy cycle. Um, as you know, um, partly because of um, issues arising from new technologies, it was decided in 2018 to do a full review of the directive when it uh, was at the grand old age of 33, which nevertheless for an EU uh, piece of law is quite, uh, quite old. And the evaluation found that it was um, working well largely on, on the whole. It had been a, a good responsive adaptive tool for consumer protection and innovation, but had some shortcomings. It didn't quite get to the bottom of the issues to do with uh, liability because of lack of evidence and data uh, at that time. And then there were the various reports that we know of the, the expert group, the Commission's white paper, Parliament too has been mentioned, they've been very active also in coming up with ideas. And yet, as I said, there is still no, um, no decision on, um, on a revision of the Product Liability Directive. And it's worth recalling that in the Commission's work programme for this year as well, it is not, uh, it's not included. So I'm sorry to disappoint uh, um, any eager, the, the eager ones uh, among you. So as I move now to maybe talk about the directive itself and the guiding uh, principles, I should make clear that, that I'll be sharing my, my personal um, views on this, not, not the, the views of the Commission itself. Um, and my personal view um, is that, uh, yes, I can see a rationale for um, a refresh of the directive to bring it up to date um, with digital technologies and modern technological uh, production and supply chains um, to ensure that it, it does continue to, to um, protect consumers. Um, guiding principles one and one and two um, are very much about the, the fundamentals of uh, the product liability regime, and I think they um, are virtually uncontroversial in, in in the sense that you know the EU has, and I think we can all agree the EU should, in the future, also have a, a regime that fosters innovation um, and ensures equal conditions for businesses to the single market that it is a regime that incentivizes the placing of safe products on the market, um, and that it's a regime that provides a simple mechanism for consumers and victims of harm when that harm nevertheless um, occurs. And here, absolutely as well, the balance of interests um, is crucial. How do you design public regulation um, that facilitates innovation and doesn't stifle it. This is nothing new. This is precisely the same um, conundrum that the original drafters of the directive um, faced. Um, on guiding principle three, the question of alignment with other laws, that's absolutely clear. The PLD does not um, exist in isolation. And I think the work of the last few years um, has shown that particularly the safety and the liability elements need to be taken as a, as a, as a whole. Um, you'll probably be aware that some of these um, important pillars of the product safety regime are currently um, being um, revised. We have the, the machinery directive um, is currently being revised, the general product safety directive later in, in the year, which uh, Agustin also mentioned, um, and also the, the new AI horizontal framework, also uh, expected um, in the spring. So I think that's absolutely clear that any, any future 
revision of the product liability directive would um, take these modernized stand uh, safety rules as a reference point. That would be very important. Um, then on the elements within the directive uh, themselves, the question of scope to which products should strict liability apply. Um, and Professor Magnikovsky made um, a very interesting presentation and I find also the ideas in the paper very interesting. Clearly it's too soon um, for, for me as an individual or, or for the Commission to enter into the intricacies of, of legislative technique. Uh, suffice it to say that I see that, that um, more clarity is needed on the question and I think setting the boundary between what software would or should be included within the definition, what the boundary is with, between that and perhaps other digital elements that needn't be or shouldn't be. Yeah? And um, that's obviously a discussion that will, that, will, that will go on. Another question of scope, um, guiding principle five, to which actors in the production chain should strict liability apply. Um, and of course, this is linked somewhat to the question of, um, of products and, and what is considered a product. Um, if, as has been suggested, digital elements were to be considered as products, then you would expect the manufacturer of, uh, of that uh, to be a producer under the, under the directive. Besides, um, uh, besides responding to emerging technologies, um, it may also be that there's an argument for considering other uh, actors, for example, in, in, in the circular economy, um, refurbishers or, or repairers and, and questioning what role they have um, on, on the safety of uh, products and whether they should be brought within, to some extent, within, within the scope. Um, when it comes to the question of um, what event triggers liability of the producer, you know, the concept of defect, uh, guiding principle six. Um, I think there are legitimate questions um, there. The, the paper and Professor Meknikovsky um, considered the, the factor of putting into circulation um, and the question whether that would be appropriate in the case of uh, software which is liable to be um, and indeed needs uh, to be updated and upgraded um, once in circulation. Um, and but more broadly um, somewhere along the lines maybe of what Agustin was suggesting maybe one needs to, to, to question what, what level of, of safety people a, a person could expect from certain new technologies from self-learning products for example or in the event of cybersecurity breaches it's uh, it's possible that that there are also adaptations in safety legislation would provide reference points um, for that if that was considered um, to be important um, the question of damage uh, what, what damage should be compensable um, under guiding principle seven um, again, a legitimate uh, question when considering uh, digital technologies, whether data loss can be covered, whether privacy infringements should be covered. Um, it's worth remembering that the Product Liability Directive doesn't include uh, non-material harm, but leaves that explicitly to, to national law. There are still routes, um, routes there for... Um, for consumer suffering and harm. Um, when it comes to the question of um, the burden of proof, this is clearly one of those issues where there is necessarily a pull between the interests of, of consumers and the interests of uh, producers. It's an issue that the evaluation uh, of the directive um, raised uh, in 2018. Um, and it focused, yes, in particular on um, consumers suffering harm from particularly complex products where it was very difficult to, um, to muster the technical expertise to, to identify uh, and prove defectiveness. 
Um, and I think that is probably um, an issue that could be aggravated with complex digital products uh, and products in complex um, ecosystems. And there, I mean, there have been various um, suggestions raised, reversal of burden of proof. One could also work with, um, consider whether information obligations on the producer could help the claimant to make, uh, to make uh, their case. Um, that would at least correct the asymmetry of information when it comes to the complexity. Um, equally, the possibility of um, presumptions um, in certain cases of presumption of defectiveness, that um, is something that perhaps could be, could be considered um, as well. And, and finally, uh, because my time is, um, is up, the question of when a, a producer um, should be released from liability, the defences uh, question guiding principle uh, nine, and equally there we've you know we've been talking this evening about the the dynamic nature of software, uh, the need for updates, the possibility of modifications after products are put into circulation, um, and that may put into question um, several of the defences that that, um, that depend on this magical moment of putting into circulation. So I think it's it's legitimate also to to consider that as a possible um, as a possible issue to address, um, and I'll leave it there. And very much looking forward to the uh, the discussion afterwards. Microphone, Christiana. Uh, really looking at the principles and, and analyzing them in depth. So that was extremely helpful. And um, um, I now see a, a long list of questions here in the chat. I will try and address them one by one. So the first one is by uh, Gerard Spindler, who was also a member of the expert group. Um, and he, he asks a quite difficult question, what about the distinction between liability of for digital services and digital products? So the services part, how do we deal with that? Is it uh, the same scope as for the digital content and services directive or is it a different scope? So maybe that's a good question for Christian. Thank you, Christiana. Thank you, Gerald, for, for the question as well. Um, if I'm honest, I hadn't thought about whether it's feasible to go beyond the narrow idea of digital products, um, because what I had in mind when I talked about digital products were specifically apps or software and perhaps algorithms. So there's a very defined, clear item that you would describe, describe as a product, I suppose, in a, in a loose sense. Um, Extending this to services raises all sorts of complex questions, I think, which um, I think they do need further thinking about. And it's not the intention to use this garden paper, this, 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 pilot, uh, this innovation paper, sorry, as the basis for going beyond the, the limits of the product liability directive itself. Well, thank you so much, Christian. And we have this, the next question from Diana Cerini, who is an Eli Fellow uh, from the University of uh, Milano. And she would like to discuss uh, the role of insurance and the need to consider new schemes. So um, uh, maybe Piotr, could you say a couple of words on, you know, what is the role of insurance in that equation? Uh, well, thank you. Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, I think that insurance was from the very beginning an important part of the whole picture because it was assumed uh, when the uh, strict liability was strict liability regime was drafted in, in the 70s and 80s, it was assumed that it, it will be insured and it must be insurable. So we have to keep uh, to this principle. And the problem is that uh, well, basically insurance market is a market. So where there's a clearly defined need, there will be a product. So what we uh, definitely need in this moment are, is uh, clear and precise liability rules so that the liability risk can be assessed and, and, and quantified and then insured. And I think that uh, this is something we should focus on. That is uh, for the producers, for, for, the, for the businesses to be able to, and for the, their insurance, to be able to quantify the risk. And then I think the market will do its work. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Thank you ever so much. Um, the next question is whether it would be fair and just to attribute liability to producers when the AI based product became unsafe in circumstances most likely unconnected to the producer. So is this maybe something that goes too far? Is that maybe something that will stifle innovation rather um, than uh, promote innovation. So um, I suspect this was a question as a reaction to one or two remarks by Piotr. So maybe I, I will pass that question to you, Piotr, despite the fact that you've just answered the last one. Yes, it's probably, uh, it's probably uh, directed to me, but uh, well, I focused on, on, uh, on the notion of a product, on digital products. So I have to, uh, I, I have to put a defect a little bit side but uh, I didn't mean that the liability regime should be for every damage connected anyhow with any product in my view and I think it's the Christian's view too uh, it still should be a liability for if a defective product so uh, there's I think there's no risk to, to, to be liable for for a damage caused uh, by product with no connection to, if I understand the question, uh, product which became unsafe uh, in, in the circumstances unconnected to the producer. I, I still see the need to do this link between how the product became defective and what the producer did at the beginning. So my, my idea of making the producer liable for the development of the product because of the new data, because of, of generally working of artificial intelligence, was still based on the assumption that at the beginning, the product was made this way, which allowed it to become unsafe. So, so in my view, it's not unrelated or unconnected to the producer. And I wouldn't support any liability regime which makes producer liable for everything that the product does. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you ever so much. Um, uh, there is a lot of further intricate questions in the chat. The next one by Monica is on digital components as contrasted with standalone software. So sometimes, you know, um, uh, the, the device itself and then the digital component is provided by different companies. Um, uh, is there a problem, um, Augustine? You you also addressed this problem of different actors in your uh, presentation. Uh, do you see particular problems there, or do you believe it can be solved with the principles and the points put forward uh, tonight? Um, actually, I think it's a, it's a very good and very practical question uh, about who is ultimately the liable party. Um, here, what I'm thinking is, of course, the level of integration and whether taking the case, for example, the sales directive, whether the digital service is actually an essential element for the functioning of the of the good. And therefore, of course, I think that the, the, the parties um, um, should be should be uh, liable. Different situation is when the uh, this software is an external element that was installed, for example, by the consumer, and that render the the um, uh, the tangible good defective, which is something I think will require further 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 consideration. Um, but um, yeah, I think I need to further think. But it's a it's a very good and practical question. The other situations, whether actually for standalone software, there should be liability. And, and here is something that we we agree that they should be, um, and then of course the the, the developer um, would uh, would be would be liable for any harms caused by the by the malfunction of the software. Thank you very much. Well, um, uh, just 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 uh, you mentioned the developer, and that is actually a point that is. Um, hardly ever raised in that debate, which is, uh, you know, who is the developer and what is the position, for example, of open source software development? 
and 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 those kinds of you know specific forms of production which you don't find in the tangible world actually and maybe i can pass that question to to mark um so uh to what extent um you know do um uh, legal instruments already reflect this or to what extent does uh, preparatory work which we see uh, in the European institutions reflect this specific form of software development and uh, what is your or what would be your recommendation how to deal with open software development? I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to de disappoint you. Um, yeah, I'm not. Um, I'm not really aware of the uh, the latest developments on open source software. So if you don't mind, uh, I'll I'll pass yes. on that. Maybe I can pass the question on to Christian. Christian, uh, what about because we always uh, speak about the producer. And, and we always have in mind that there is a big software company somewhere in the world that makes a fortune by selling that software, but uh, some software is not developed that way. So how should we deal with that, Christian? I think that's part of a wider um, problem, I think, that now faces a lot of the existing legislation, either in its current form or its most recent form. Uh, and that is that it's still very much based on these very traditional bifurcations between, on the one hand, the individual, the private, non-commercial user, the consumer in many cases, and the trader, the business, the producer on the other side. And clearly those boundaries have long since been blurred. We have, for years, we've had a discussion around the, the prosumer who gets actively involved in all sorts of contexts. It's not just this context. Um, you know, in the case of online platforms, we have private sellers becoming traders on which there is now European case law. Um, 3D printing is one of my other pet interests. And again, they are the, the creation of CAD files by private individuals, which are then made available online, which could cause defective products to emerge, in fact. Again, raises some very difficult and unresolved questions. And I think the same is true when it comes to open source creation, where um, people are involved who might not be doing this on a professional basis, um, not for professional gain. And the question there has to be, to what extent are people in this position to be liable? I think that's a, that's a serious debate that needs to be had. What sort of, does it need some kind of intermediate level of liability? So instead of having trader and private individual, do we need, I suppose, semi-professional or um, you know, something along those lines. And do we therefore also need to draw on a wider range of possible mechanisms to ensure compensation where things have gone wrong? I noticed another question, I think from Robert Bray in the chat, which raises the question of insurance schemes and, and the role they might play. And this is something which has come up on a number of occasions in these discussions, that some of the complexities of identifying who is responsible for the fault ultimately um, whether that's with AI and AI that goes a, uh, goes 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 rogue because of whatever it has done with the algorithm or other contexts, there might be a case for relying on insurance schemes as opposed to direct liability schemes to provide another route to compensation. Now, whether that's as an alternative or as a special fallback position in those cases where the normal route to compensation doesn't apply, that's again a debate that needs to be had. And I think... Um, that needs to be an integral part of any discussions regarding the revisions to the directive. Well, thank you very much. And that's also addressed uh, 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 Robert Bray's question and in part probably also one of Gerald's questions about, uh, you know, the, the, the distributed uh, manner of, of, you know, how software is, is, is produced and, and also marketed. And um, we yeah, have... Sorry. If, yeah. if, I could, if I could actually add, yes. add something on, on the point of open software. Um, and, and that's remind me and immediately went to the um, digital content is the services directive, which actually makes an exemption. So the directive does not apply to open software. And it's very similar to the discussion we're having now, because while, of course, open software is seen so, from a societal uh, uh, policy perspective as something good, because it's a part participatory way of creating things. 
but at the same time, we make carve-outs in the legislation where, yes, eventually if something goes wrong, you know, the law says, well, here there is nothing to look at. So then I think with, I totally agree with Christian, we really need to have a fundamental discussion and connecting all these kind of these broader policy objectives about what is the place of open source in our society, in the future of our economy, vis-a-vis -vis the rules that we are developing you know, for situations like we are discussing today regarding liability of, this, uh, of, of digital products. But I, I think it's an extremely important, important discussion and we have already a precedent in the digital content and digital services directive uh, which make an exemption to this type of uh, software. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. It was indeed uh, these these exemptions, these carve outs, which I had in mind, and which we probably need to discuss also in the in the product liability um, context. So, thank you very much for 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 mentioning these other instruments. And um, there are some uh, questions in the chat that also deal with with entirely different questions. And one is by Lampros, are the provisions applicable in fraud cases? Now this, of course, we already mentioned privacy and what kind of damage should be covered. Um, so who would like to to comment on that? Maybe Augustine, would you like uh, to, to continue? Do we need um, specific uh, legislation for fraud? Well, we do have legislation on fraud, of course, but the question is, is product liability the right place for that? Or is that rather something to be dealt with by other instruments and other areas of the law? That's a very good question. I think at the bottom of the discussion is how much we should stretch the product liability regime. This is already dealt mostly by national uh, national law. Um, so I think there's a, a some, uh, delicate uh, balance about what is the scope that needs to be harmonized also vis-a-vis -vis, mm -hmm. you know, the principles of, of proportionality and subsidiarity uh, and, and, and whether we should go that far in uh, harmonization of um, national mm -hmm. um, tort law systems, bearing in mind that member states are extremely skeptical when it comes to harmonizing uh, tort law regimes. Um, so yeah, I need to leave it open that question because it is indeed a, a, a matter I'm hoping for. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid we're running a little bit out of time, but there maybe we can uh, uh, go a little bit uh, longer. So um, there are important questions in the chat on online marketplaces and the role they should play. And um, uh, I, I would maybe like to ask Mark on that. Now we see um, a, a lot of legislation um, in the in the tax field. Um, in we see the market surveillance regulation and so on that try to bring online marketplaces into the equation. Now, uh, would you see uh, or would you believe that it would only be logical to bring marketplaces also into the equation in this context? Or do you believe the product liability context? You already touched on that in your presentation, but maybe would you believe uh, what is the role of um, online marketplaces in the product liability context? Um, well, if I, if I understand um, correctly, an online marketplace could be considered um, um, a supplier. But I think, as um, Agustin was, was saying in his uh, presentation, um, the rules under the, under the Product Liability Directive would be that once um, the online marketplace um, informs the consumer who the, produ who the producer is, um, they don't, they're not subject to uh, strict liability. So, I mean, with the Digital Services Act now, I know there are provisions on uh, ensuring that online marketplaces don't hide behind their, um, their, their business customers. Um, they have to know, know them, they have to have information on them. So my preliminary feeling is that if, if that um, is complied with, um, then it would probably, um, barring a considerable change to the directive, 
um, they wouldn't need to be um, subject to strict liability because they would inform the consumer who the producer is. Yeah? But certainly as to the question whether, um, more broadly speaking, it would be um, desirable to, to bring them more closely into, into the strict liability regime, that's, um, that's something um, for others to make the case and for us to listen in any consultations uh, that we do uh, later on. Thank you very much, colleagues. Um, I see there's a lot of questions that are also coming up. We've touched many of them. Um, maybe uh, one question that is a general one. Um, uh, there's a question about free digital products. Now we know uh, free is a very vague notion. We see the digital content and services directive that has clarified, you know, there's you know, no such thing as really free uh, products. Uh, often data is given in exchange. Now, uh, a quick last round. Um, what are the most important carve outs you would see uh, for um, uh, an extended product liability uh, regime? And maybe we can combine that with a quick last round around the table. So uh, where are the no-goes? Where should an extended product liability regime um, most likely not touch upon? Maybe we can um, uh, take that as a last round as a question to wrap up. So, um, uh, Christian, would you like to start? Uh, thank you. Um, maybe I'll be a little bit provocative now. I'll start by saying nothing should be off the table at this stage, but it needs careful consideration. There may be good arguments for saying, or uh, intuitively saying, that if there's no economic benefit, then in line with the current approach, um, we ought not to extend liability to persons who don't get economically. But as you already hinted, Christiana, um, economic gain can come from multiple directions. Obviously, a lot of the so-called free digital content uh, or, or digital products um, are, in fact, indirectly paid for either through access to, to data, including personal data, but also normal other data, uh, or indirectly through advertising. And we know that indirect financing still constitutes remuneration, for example, for the purposes of, of EU law. Um, so the, the kind of circumstance where there's true provision of free content is, is probably quite a narrow one. Um, but I will come back to the more general point, which gets me back to guiding principle one. We need to make sure that there are no loopholes which could cause private individuals to be uncompensated where they suffer injury or, or, or more, more significantly uh, loss of data and so on, if the regime is meant to be comprehensive and watertight. Whether that can be done through liability rules in a narrow sense or through a combination of liability and, say, some kind of insurance scheme, I think I think Australia has a, has a public insurance scheme, um, that might be something that needs to be considered as part of the whole discussion around an improved liability regime. Thank you very much. Um, Augustine, would you like to continue? Yes, I can only agree with Christian that nothing should be off the table <laughs> for the time being. I think we, um, we really um, need to see how the, a revised product liability regime will fit vis-a-vis -vis the other instrument that regulate this type of product. Um, uh, we have already the Cyber the Cyber Security Act, probably something new on cyber security as well coming up from the from the European Commission. Um, the digital the digital content is the services directive, the um, new sets of good directive, the DMA, the DSA, uh, the GPSD. So there are several instruments. Um, that are currently under, the, they have just been adopted, are on, under transposition, or are going to be, um, are discussed, or going to be presented by the by the Commission. So I think it's extremely important to keep coherence between the different um, the different instruments. And, and as I say, I think that the update of the new regime you know, should be um, oriented to creating a safety net 
for all big teams when it comes to um, uh, new technologies and new type of products that they were not thought at the time the directive was adopted, but also new models of distribution. Let's face it, platforms are taking an extremely important role in our economy nowadays. Just think about you know, the pandemic. When all shops have to close, consumers, they went directly to the online marketplaces. And there is still going going there. So the the growth of this this platform has been um, quite considerable in the in the in the last years, and and therefore they need to play, play also a role in this liability chain. And I think that uh, clarity in the um, in the regime will be will be fundamental to defining under which circumstances these players are are liable. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Piotr. Well, uh... I agree with Christian that we should be open-minded, but uh, to me there's one thing which is often in, in, in the case of product liability, that is the liability of a, a creator of a product which is distributed for free, and I mean for free uh, in the strictest sense of the word. That is, uh, to me at least, the, the, the idea of, of this liability, the strict liability, is based on the, on the assumption that there is someone who has a control over the risk and benefits from, from putting others at the risk. So he is responsible in a, in a loose sense of the word for the defect, he controlled the production process and benefits from, the, from putting the product in the market. If this other element is missing, there's no benefit. There's no, in my view, there's no sufficient justification for making this person strictly liable. But if the, if the app, for example, or any other digital product is distributed to well, in exchange for uh, personal data or any other data, it's not free anymore. Well, if data has a value and it has a value, it doesn't really matter whether the, the counter performance is money or is, is data or, or access to, to advertisement, it's still economic benefit for the, for the producer. So in this case, I see no problems with making this producer liable, but when it's really free, to me, it does not fit in the, the, this regime we are talking about. Thank you so much, uh, Piotr. And Mark, uh, you have the last word because the Commission definitely has the last word or the uh -huh. European legislator definitely has the last word when it comes to revising the product liability directive. Well, as I, as I said, there's, a, the, there's the big if, but um, having previously worked in the European Parliament, uh, I know that the Commission uh, doesn't have uh, the last word uh, when it comes to <laughs> European legislation. But, um, but um, I mean, I think what will be absolutely crucial, um, and in a, in a way this, this, this is, is valid, whether or not there is um, an imminent or coming um, revision, is that the, the balance, uh, the, the foundational principles uh, remain uh, solid, that it continues to protect consumers, but that it does so in a way that doesn't um, hamper innovation. No, I think that's, that foundational balance is, is crucial. And also um, that the coherence with other legislation is maintained and improved and, and, and kept as well. Well, thank you ever so much. And also for mentioning again that this should not stifle innovation. I think that is a concern which we all share and of course, which we all have to bear in mind when uh, submitting suggestions um, uh, for uh, revising the PLD. Um, as we all know, we are living in a pandemic and as we all know the pandemic means a burden for um, businesses it means a burden for the industry so um, innovation will be key to um, you know make us find solutions for overcoming the crisis and and innovation and 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 supporting innovation is also key um, for the future of Europe um, there were a lot of um, aspects which we were not um, able to cover tonight, but we uh, couldn't expect actually to, to cover all aspects.
aspects. Um, I see uh, a lot of very, very interesting questions in the chat, which we unfortunately cannot deal with now, but we will save the chat. So um, the ELI Secretariat, um, whom I would like to thank really for um, organizing this and for being in the background and moderating this. So Katya isn't visible at the moment, but I would like to extend a great thanks to Katya and to the whole team for um, organizing this uh, so diligently. They will save the chat and they will forward the chat to our distinguished panelists. And so maybe we can can uh, stay in touch and, and uh, continue the discussion. Because as Christian has said, um, this is just, um, you know, to, to kick off a discussion. And uh, even though this was now launched as an innovation paper, the ELI will have to discuss whether it is worth taking this forward. And, and in that regard, Mark, it's not at all bad news that you say it's not in the work program for this year, because this means the ELI may have some time uh, to, to, to discuss the project further. And uh, we will certainly do so um, with all the distinguished panelists of tonight. We will certainly uh, make sure we have our members involved. We are very grateful to everybody um, on the panel, but also to all the audience uh, who posed questions. Um, it's, it, it's not as good as being in a room together and raising your hand and seeing each other face to face, but it's the best we can get during those uh, very difficult times. So thank you very much uh, to everybody for participating in the discussion. I think it was very fruitful, important points were raised. And I uh, hope to see you next time. Stay tuned. Uh, it will not be the last webinar of the ELI and we will be in touch soon. So all the best to um, our participants, all the best to the panelists. Thank you very much again and stay safe and see you next time.